Hi, we are about to get started um, with our um, uh, STAR presentation for privacy and user differences this morning. Um, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speakers, um, giving us a, a presentation on privacy prefer, pre preserving data visualization. And our speakers. Um, privacy preserving data visualization. And our speakers. Um, sorry. Um, sorry about that. And our speakers are uh, Kustav and uh, Ritra. Good afternoon, everyone. So today we will be presenting our state of the art report on privacy preserving data visualization. I'm Arito Dasgupta, an assistant professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And this work has been bravely led by my PhD student, Kostav Bhattacharji, in his very first semester of the graduate program, and ably supported by Men Chen, my long-term collaborator and a professor at the University of Oxford. So privacy-preserving data visualization is a much younger subfield as compared to some of the other subfields of data visualization. But we believe that the time is ripe for a state-of-the-art report because privacy is and will always be a threat in this era of digital transformation. And we strongly believe that visualization we will play an integral role there. So through this state-of-the-art report, we see that what has been done over the past 10 years or so and what can be done in the future to address those challenges. With that, we start with looking at the privacy crisis itself. So privacy has been a newsmaker over the past two years. So we have seen uh, posts on New York Times with uh, the actual locations for millions of Americans that can be visualized readily. Obviously, that's not the ideal scenario. We have seen the privacy crisis unfolding at Facebook involving the controversy with Cambridge Analytica, forcing the leadership to think about privacy issues more carefully. And even in midst of the global pandemic of COVID-19, we have seen the importance of contact tracing apps and the inherent fear that using these applications will include monitoring and sharing of personal data, something that could be beyond our control. And when I searched for the term data privacy on Google, all the results that came up with, I came up with was involving COVID-19 and the risk of uh, data sharing with these contact tracing apps. So the privacy crisis was and is very much relevant and will probably become even more relevant in, in the times to come. What is our defense against this crisis? Our defense has been some of the policies like HIPAA in the US or more recently the GDPR, all targeted around protecting data subjects. And of course, there are these company policies, some of which are obscure. Um, they function in a way that uh, they make it more complicated than necessary in many, many of these uh, websites, which have privacy policies. And we have seen some emerging data, uh, some emerging research areas on data ethics and GDPR compliance and ethical data information management, all of which are um, initiatives in the research and education community for handling this emerging challenge. So if we look at the data ecosystem and if we try to understand privacy, because sometimes we can think of privacy as a very uh, unidimensional concept as uh, people's data is shared in a way that we protect privacy. But there are multiple stakeholders involved in that process. There are these data owners or data custodians who collect and manage data. Proprietary data is converted to sanitize data by using some kind of anonymization models and data owners and custodians really want to understand the trade-offs between risks and utility when uh, data is anonymized and when there's a reduction in value in, the, in that anonymized data set. Of course, we are, uh, when data is shared, they are about data subjects uh, who themselves sometimes need to understand what are the implications of sharing their own data through, let's say, social networking websites or through their smartphones. And ultimately, we have the data consumer who could be the same as the data subject or different from a data subject like an analyst or a decision maker who is trying to use, make use of the anonymized data to derive value out of it. They need to be aware of the privacy policies, access the data in a way that doesn't violate the intended privacy guarantees. And there is also the data attacker, right? So who have malicious intent and who want to break privacy. 
And visualization, if we conceptualize the role of visualization, they play a role in all these stages and they serve all the stakeholders that are involved, like data owners and custodians, data subjects, uh, data consumers, and visualization can also be used by attacker to breach privacy. So for data owners and data custodians, visualization can help in understanding the outcomes of privacy preserving data algorithms or introduce additional uncertainty to the visualization process or even understand the risk benefit trade-offs and more recently, we have seen some approaches of use of visualization for understanding privacy policies. So through this state-of-the-art report, we will try to bring together all the knowledge that is kind of hidden in um, the papers that have been published in both visualization-specific venues and some of the application venues like social science and healthcare and privacy and security, and try to give a sense of First, give a sense of the role of visualization for these different stakeholders that I discussed. Provide a task-driven analysis uh, why, when we look at the mapping across the, those roles and the problems and solutions as part of privacy-preserving visualization. And then ultimately conclude with some guidance for some of the emerging research areas that we can think of that can help address the privacy crisis and challenge. So if you look at our methodology, we had a three-stage uh, process where we first collected papers from visualization specific venues. We also collected papers from different application specific venues which I mentioned like healthcare, social science and security research. We ended up with uh, the total number of papers that we ended up and that's all there in the supplemental material uh, was around 400 but then we did some filtering on our own because we only wanted to focus on papers that provided visualization as a solution to the privacy preservation problem and not just mention uh, the word visual and visualization as, as part of one or two sentences. And the third stage involved categorization of the papers in terms of the problems and solutions and ultimately the analysis of the gaps and research opportunities that we will conclude with. Next, we will, I will hand over to my student Kostov who will talk in more depth about the categorization, the classification scheme and give examples about the specific visualization techniques intended for privacy preservation. Let's discuss the privacy preserving data visualization pipeline we showed earlier. In this section, we will discuss the anonymization. So this model transforms the proprietary data into the sanitized data. The first model which we are going to discuss is the key anonymity model. On the left hand side, we have a data set from the hospital's clinical records. This has quasi-identifiers like nationality, zip code, and age, along with some sensitive attributes like disease. In this table, the individuals are uniquely identifiable. But if we apply the K-anonymity model to this dataset, then on the right-hand side, we have a four anonymous table. In this table, we can easily see there are three different groups and the individuals cannot be uniquely identified from this table. But if an attacker has background knowledge, then they can easily understand or identify an individual from this table. In order to overcome this limitation, we use a diversity model. On the left hand side, we have the same hospital data set and on the right hand side, we have a three diverse table. In this table, we can see that within each group, there are three different values for the sensitive attribute disease. So this overcomes the limitations of K anonymity. But if somebody knows that all the diseases in the last class, that is this class, are related to liver, then they can easily identify that any individual within this group has a liver problem. Thus, we use a more robust concept of uh, differential privacy. This states that any analyst analyzing a differentially private data will lead to the same inference about the individual's private information, irrespective of the fact that the individual's private data was used or not. 
Now let's, let us discuss the privacy task and the role of visualization. In this section, we will describe the privacy task and we will also describe the classification scheme used in our paper. In this classification scheme, we looked at each of the papers and classified them on the basis of the problem characterization and privacy preserving data visualization. In problem characterization, we, we have classified the papers on the basis of the target user addressed and the privacy problem referred to in these papers. We have also classified the papers on the basis of the privacy tasks discussed. Then we have classified the papers using the enumeration methods used in these papers like data uncertainty and visual uncertainty. Some papers have used visual uncertainty, uncertainty that is uncertainty in the screen space in order to anonymize the data. Next, we also list out the visualization techniques used by these papers. So the most important task which we have observed in our collection of papers is hiding data. It is important for the data owner to hide data in order to increase the privacy of a data set of the data set. On the left hand side, we can see from this matrix that the teacher 2 goes to dorm in every time interval and the student 1 goes to dorm in the first three time intervals and then goes to the bar in the last time intervals. But if we use the Sankey diagram on the right hand side, we can easily identify different group of student and teachers, but we cannot individually pinpoint their location in each time interval. Thus, this example use uncertainty in the data space as a privacy preservation mechanism. Here is another example of hiding data. In this example, we show the vulnerability of the position channel. On the left hand side in this parallel coordinate, some of the individuals can be uniquely identified from this axis. But if we reduce the granularity using different techniques like binning, aggregation, then we can see from the image on the right hand side that this cluster cannot uniquely identify those individuals. This example uses uncertainty in the screen space as a protection mechanism. Next, we discuss the privacy task of evaluating risk. In order to make a dataset public, the data owner must evaluate the risks associated with that dataset. So this is an interface developed by Kao et al. named Odd Visualizer, which will help in this task. From the image on the left hand side, we can see that gender, race and salary class have the highest key anonymity values, but native country has the lowest one. After some processing from the image on the right hand side, we can understand that the cluster gender, salary class, education, martial status and race have the highest protection against privacy leakage than other attributes. Next, we discuss the task of evaluating trade-offs. It is a known fact that increasing privacy in a dataset may reduce the utility of that dataset. So the data owner must take a call between the trade-offs between utility and privacy. So this is a tool named VC developed by Zhao et al. which collected different accelerometer data from several mobile devices and showed them in this interface. This interface has parallel coordinates, feature gate diagrams, ranking charts and a appropriate combination of features and sampling rates will make a good decision between the trade off a good decision on the trade off between utility and privacy. 
Next, we have the privacy task of company algorithms. In order to understand the effectiveness of each privacy preserving scheme, the data owner must compare all these algorithms. So this is the interface developed by Wang et al named graph protector. On the left hand side, we have the graph protector view which integrates multiple privacy preserving schemes. On the right hand side, we see the provenance view which shows the effect caused by each process. We also have the utility view and the priority view which shows the processing priority for each node. The next privacy task is to understand the privacy policies of different websites. So the data subject or the, and the data owner also must know how their personal information are being used in the privacy of different websites. In this example, Dhatra et al. have developed an interface which will perform semi-automatic analysis in order to make the user aware how their PII, personally identifiable information, is being used in the website. We also have another example of understanding privacy policy. In this, in, in this mobile application developed by Barini et al., the users are made aware of how the mobile application is using their uh, privacy per permissions and thus, take the, thus help the user make a good decision of whether or not using the app. Again, refer to the privacy preserving data visualization pipeline we discussed earlier. In this section, we will discuss the vulnerability of high and low accuracy channels and also discuss how an attacker can exploit them using background knowledge. This is a reference diagram in order to understand the high and low accuracy channels. So the channels on the on the top like position are high accuracy channels but the ch channels on the bottom like volume are low accuracy channels. So this is an example of the vulnerability of the high accuracy channels like position. So in this example the authors have used cluster in order to reduce the granularity of the parallel coordinates and the scatter plot. But if an attacker knows the edge points, then they would be easily able to identify the individuals on these edge points. In order to overcome this limit limitation, the authors have suggested using cluster overlaps so that even if an attacker knows a certain individual on the axis A, then they would not be able to figure out the exact location of that individual on axis B. Next, we have another example where the position channel was transformed into a density-based representation in a geographical map. But this still suffers from the vulnerability due to interactivity because if an attacker zooms in this map, then they would be able to figure out the exact location of the individuals represented in this map. We have another example of how, how vulnerable are the low accuracy channels are. On the figure in the left hand side, we have Glyph. Glyph is a popular representation used in the healthcare domain. In this example, we have the glyph of a patient with the information of the disease incidence in, this, in the population. Combining this knowledge with publicly available data set, an attacker can easily pinpoint the geographical region where the patient belongs to. So this is a vulnerability of the low accuracy channels due to background knowledge. Alright, so with that we come to the last segment of our presentation. So far we have discussed about the role of visualization in the data ecosystem, talking about different privacy stakeholders like data owners or data custodians, data subjects and consumers. 
and then creating a mapping between those roles and the problems and solutions that have been proposed as part of the literature on privacy preserving data visualization. What we will do now is to try to synthesize those findings and provide a guidance for a privacy focused research agenda of the future, where we create a mapping between what has been done and what can be done through the lens of existing research areas in data visualization, like uncertainty visualization or urban data visualization, so that people working in those areas can get an immediate impetus to include the privacy focused research questions as part of their own research agenda. So one of our first findings in this regard is that there is a complete lack of empirical evaluation about people's perception of privacy. To understand how well the anonymization algorithms hold good in practice so that what we want to achieve in this case is to make data as uncertain as possible so that people are not able to break through the privacy barriers. So we can imbibe some of the concepts and methodologies from uncertainty perception and communication and apply those in these studies to understand both how well people understand privacy and what are the guarantees, the, how well the theoretical guarantees of privacy for the anonymization algorithms they hold good in practice. Second, we see that in many cases where data sets are openly available like these open data portals like New York City etc. Whenever personal data is involved, there is a release and forget model that is applied where there is some care taken at the time of release uh, for not including sensitive information. But then as we can imagine, data sets are continuously updated. So there could be links that people did not foresee at the time of sharing, but those links can be accidentally created when new data sets are released. So in that case, there's a need for dynamic evaluation of risks and visualization can play, play a very strong role there. Related to that, urban data is very rich in analytical value, but it's also fraught with privacy risks because they, involves, they involve data about people's movement and location. So how can visualization help decision makers better understand the privacy utility trade-offs where they can make the key decisions from people's um, movement and location data, but they do that in a way that, that is privacy preserving, that preserve the identity of the people involved in those data sets. Fourth, we have seen that there is an ongoing effort in some of the application domains like security uh, where uh, visualization is being increasingly used for understanding policy. What are the implications of policies for better compliance for data owners and also for communicating those policies to data subjects. We have seen some sporadic use of visualization but we believe that sophisticated visual analytics techniques like graph basis analysis or text based analysis can play a strong role to make policies more interpretable for both data owners and data consumers. Lastly, as visualization designers we sometimes have this privilege of accessing the raw data. But we should exercise that privilege with caution and build in privacy by design practices in while conceptualizing and implementing visual analytic interfaces so that sensitive information is not accidentally divulged or we are not portraying data in a way that can help people understand private information. Related to that, data subjects in many cases come from vulnerable sections of the society like we've seen use of privacy preserving techniques for drug trafficking victims. In those cases where data needs to be collected about those victims to give them better access to technology, visualization can play an important role as a transparent medium for people to understand the risks in collecting data about people where there should be appropriate checks and balances put into place where their, their identity is not revealed. So all of these together, they hopefully they provide some food for thought about the future, future research agenda. So this brings to the conclusion of our talk here. So hopefully we have been able to give you a very broad overview of the different stakeholders in the privacy preserving data ecosystem, the role of visualization thereof, and what can we do in the future. With that, these are again some of the highlights of some the future, what the future research agenda looks like from our perspective. And Hopefully, this will ignite some thinking as part of your own research, how they connect to the research agenda that you are currently involved in and give you some impetus to incorporate the privacy-focused research questions. This will only help us 
collectively move forward to handle the privacy crisis, which I started out with in, in my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to again acknowledge the contributions of Gustav and Min in this work. And with that, we are ready for your questions. Awesome, thank you so much. That was a really good um, presentation. Uh, so we're currently taking any questions on the, um, the YouTube channel. Um, so please feel free to um, send in your questions, but I'll, I'll start us off. Um, so again, this is really interesting. And as uh, my background is also in uncertainty visualization, and I think it's really interesting um, sort of adding uncertainty in to do this privacy preservation. But at the same time, there has to be this um, understanding of the data, I guess, sort of before uncertainty. Um, so there's, it feels like there's a certain responsibility of the visualization scientists to both understand um, uh, what is going on with the data, but at the same time, keeping the preservation. Can you give me a little like, uh, anything about that sort of trade-off between the two? So can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so Christy, if I understand your question correctly, uh, so you're asking about the uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty that needs to be injected in a visualization for privacy reservation purposes. So there is, uh, so there's been a lot of work uh, looking into, uh, you know, trade-offs between the loss and utility because any kind of uncertainty we inject in the data would lead to loss of utility. Uh, but some of that uncertainty is needed. And uh, as, as part of my own work, I've looked into kind of two types of uncertainty broadly. One is uncertainty, uh, which we uh, we classified in this paper, uncertainty in two kind of broad types. Uncertainty in the data space, uh, like taking traditional metrics, uh, key anonymity, uh, diversity, et cetera, and trying to see their impact on the resulting visualization. And also uncertainty in the screen space or what we term as visual uncertainty, which results from the transformation of data from, let's say, the unlimited screen space to screen space with limited resolution pixels, there's inherent uh, loss in, in uh, information in, in that translation. So we kind of looked at how we can leverage that uncertainty systematically. So I, we call it intended uncertainty to um, hide uh, information in, in the screen space where you are not accessing the data directly, but you're looking at the data through the lens of the visualization. Um, I would say that one of the key gaps is, um, as we also pointed out in the paper, is the perception, user perception of privacy and how much of that uncertainty is actually um, needed or, um, so there, there's a lot of uh, parallels I can draw with uh, the ongoing research in uncertainty perception and communication in, in the broader visualization community. Um, so barring probably one or two papers, I didn't, we didn't come across any studies which look at uh, privacy guarantees, um, practical privacy guarantees, not the theoretical guarantees. So there is, a, there is a lot of scope for conducting empirical studies to look at the effect of uncertainty on users' perception of privacy. Um, Hopefully that 
that answered your question. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. And um, I think kind of to follow up on that, I'm curious about what the, what you feel are the uh, roles and responsibilities um, for each of the people that have a stake in this. Um, I've personally, uh, it feels a little um, challenging uh, in terms of, you know, the, the issues that we have as visualization designers, and then also having this like weight on our shoulders of also do the privacy preservation um, stuff. So what do you see as the relationship between all the people that are kind of involved in this and how much as we as visualization people do we need to pay attention to this? Yeah, I think uh, the, 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 the weight on our shoulders comment is definitely on, on spot because uh, we also uh, say in the paper that uh, as, as visualization designers, researchers, we have this privilege of uh, sometimes having unlimited access to uh, data. And we should use that uh, use that carefully because of the broader broader ethical Im implications. Um, as um, we have seen, I think in the, one of the Kai papers last year, uh, there was a paper on ethics of data visualization, which says that visualize uh, you know visualization is not a uh, kind of an ethically neutral activity. So any kind of uh, because. We've, we are um, you know, describing what is in there in the data. So we have some responsibility towards protecting the identity of the individuals that uh, are represented in the data may or may not be unintentionally, whose identity may or may not be unintentionally compromised. That's one aspect. Uh, but I also see that um, there is a, so one of the things that we did in this paper was look at um, some of the application areas like social sciences, health, uh, healthcare research, et cetera, um, where visualization is currently being used as part of, uh, you know, the kind of data privacy ecosystem. So uh, I, I see there's a lot of scope of, of visualization being effective, especially for data owners and data custodians for really understanding as, as your first question talked about uncertainty uh, and, um, risks uh, and the uh, risk and utility trade-offs. I think that's a great use of visualization for data owners. Um, as, as visualization designers, as I said, I think um, you know, there, there are obviously some, some challenges in, in kind of understanding how it uh, plays out. As also for data subjects, I believe that visualization, right now we see a lot of focus on um, contact tracing applications for example right so data as as data subjects we are kind of uh, the receiving end of uh, privacy violations where it's almost a given that there will be some gain in in you know public health as as uh, with loss in, in individual privacy and i believe that visualization being a naturally kind of transparent medium it can give more control to uh, uh, data owners and, and their data subjects to understand uh, where, you know, how uh, data is shared publicly and what are the implications of data sharing. Uh, another gap that we found in this context is um, understanding privacy policies. So all of us uh, uh, have probably looked at uh, or, or just uh, clicked on, we acknowledge the privacy policy without even reading them. Uh, and uh, there has been some research not in the, uh, you know, visualization community, but again, in the application, some of the application areas uh, uh, where people have looked at, you know, using um, uh, some kind of visualization to communicate uh, implications of policies, whether it's for data owners to know how well they adhere to those policies or for data subjects to understand, again, the implications of their data being shared. So in all of those aspects, I think visualization can, uh, can play a role. So and all of these people have different stakes in the privacy ecosystem. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. This is very, very interesting. Really appreciate the work. Um, so I think with that, we're probably ready to move on to the next uh, talk. Um, and so our, our next talk is on um, individual differences in visualization. And the presentation is going to be by uh, Zhang Lian Lao and Alvi is going to be here to answer some questions for us. Hi, my name is Jinyan Lu, and today I'm going to present my research titled Survey on Individual Differences in Visualization. It is a survey paper um, that investigates 
research related to personalities and cognitive and cognitive abilities and their influences on data visualization use. So what are individual differences? They are defined as traits or stable tendencies to respond to certain classes of stimuli or situations in predictable ways. Essentially, they can be either classified as personality traits or cognitive abilities. And we are going to go through these concepts in the following uh, slides. Studies have demonstrated that personality traits and cognitive abilities can have substantial impact on task performance, usage patterns, and user satisfaction and subjective assessment. All of these are important factors to data visualization. These Hello? results also indicate Am I logging that personality right can be hampered in the presence of incompatible visualizations. So the scope of this survey focuses on personality traits, for example, five-factor models or locus of control and cognitive ability, spatial ability or perceptual speed are some examples of this class. We do not include social constructs such as gender and ethnicity. We do not include them in the definition of individual differences in this paper. We also do not include cognitive states or aspects of the user that can change throughout the session, for example, emotion. These are unstable traits. Or learned behavior such as experience, education, literacy, and bias. We conducted the, the, the methodology of this survey. The first part of this is through web scraping of seed papers that contain certain keywords. We web scrape IEEE or ACM digital libraries. And then we conduct a back for, backward and forward citation search um, from the seed papers and we gather a large pool of candidate papers. Eventually, we manually select the papers that we deem to be most relevant to this topic. Eventually, we find 29 papers that are in scope. We code our papers with tags. So, for example, a paper that investigates the influence of locus of control on search performance of users using hierarchical data visualization will have the tags tree search locals of control and they will be classified into different categories here for example uh, and those big four categories here are the traits viz tasks and measures the structure of the survey um, can be seen from this table here relatively clearly um, we have some trades, visualizations, tasks, and measures classified into categories. Each paper um, will be classified accordingly to these categories, along with a sample science here. Um, so the first part is traits. The second part is visualizations used by these papers, by these studies. And then finding the tasks and the measures. Okay, so traits. Researchers have examined 13 different cognitive traits. Um, we classify into these 13 categories. Um, these are the most common ones um, that exist in the current research literature. Some examples include perceptual speed, which is defined as a rate at which an individual is able to make accurate visual comparisons between objects. Okay, this is a cognitive ability first proposed by psychologists. So, for example, um, this is part of a test key, which measures per a person's perceptual speed. Um, how fast can you match a given object? Uh, these are the... the so, perceptual speed has been shown to be positively correlated with the accuracy of the computing derived values. This is one of the key findings um, of the paper. It is also quite true for a few studies that we have surveyed. Essentially, it is positively related with the accuracy of conducting certain tasks. It is also individuals with high perceptual speed also tend to complete tasks faster overall. There are some nuances. Um, for example, in certain cases, 
people with low perceptual speed perform better with certain graphs, but the overall trend is that individuals with high perceptual speed complete tasks faster. Another example is verbal working memory, which is defined as ability to temporarily store and manipulate language-related information, including both words and numerical values. Again, this is a, uh, a trait defined by psychologists. Some key findings include participants with low verbal working memory consistently underperform on comparison tasks, and the the uh, the reverse is true as well. Also, um, verbal working memory was observed to have an intuitive negative correlation with time on tasks. High verbal working memory users spend less time reading and processing various textual information and visualizations. Essentially, the, the key mechanism behind the relationship between verbal working memory and task performance is because people with high verbal working memory tend to process textual information faster, which greatly um, facilitates their, uh, their use of the data visualization to complete tasks. A third example is locus of control, which is defined as the extent to which a person believes the external world is influenced by their own actions and or whether they have control over the outcome of events occurring around them. This is defined as a personality trait. Verbal working memory and perceptual speed are cognitive abilities, and locus of control is an example of personality trait. So locus of control can be divided into two groups. Um, Internals versus externals. Internals are those who believe that themselves have better control of the, their surrounding environments and outcomes of events. Externals are those who believe outside forces have a have control over the events and situations around them. Internals were found to be significantly faster than externals in performing procedural tasks. Overall, also. Externals were faster and more accurate than internals by another study. So there is a contradiction here. Um, and the author of the second paper explained by um, stating that internals and external complete procedural tasks are approximately the same speed, which means the first study may or may not. Or it, basically, the contextual uh, differences might, um, might change the results into either directions because they are actually approximately the same speed. But internals were significantly slower than externals in completing inferential tasks, which are more open-ended questions than procedural tasks. Some also find that they apply different search strategies to visual search tasks. A fourth example is visual working memory. Again, this is another cognitive ability. It defined as the capacity to remember the appearance, configuration, location, or orientation of an object. With bar charts, some participants were found who had low visual or verbal working memory consistently underperform on comparison tasks, similar to the results we cited about verbal working memory. Also, those with higher visual working memory tended to prefer charts over maps. So these, these are some of the key findings related to visual working memory. Again, the findings slided here are not exhaustive, so please refer to the paper for more information. Um, it is both forms of working memory also useful for predict participants' learning curve using bar charts, and um, this is characterized by the rate of change in response time of tasks over multiple trials. We also classify the studies according to the visualization they tested with, so some examples include, we define five categories, simple visualization. Examples include bar charts and histograms, statistical visualizations. Examples include hippie plots, box plots, graphs. Which examples include trees, dendrograms, high dimensional charts. These in, some examples include radar charts because it is a graph that is used to describe relationship um, in a high dimensional setting, which means um, and spatial charts, which include 3D object projections, node link diagrams. So there's really not too much to talk about the visualizations because they are, um, it depends on what the researchers want to accomplish with their hypotheses 
or their research goals related to personality traits or cognitive abilities, they will choose different visualizations to achieve their tasks. So some key findings include that, um, some summary of our findings include that the hierarchical visualizations, which include trees and dendrograms, they largely focus on the impact of local control and the five-factor model. Um, user, authors, use, researchers use these graphs to research the impact of local control and five-factor models. This is a, a phenomenon we observe. Um, there's no theoretical explanation for why this happens, but um, this is just a phenomenon. Also, statistical visualizations are often used to investigate the effects of spatial ability. Again, this is something, uh, something we a pattern we observe, but there's no inherent reason why this should be the case. We also observe eight categories of tasks. Um, most of these are, some examples include finding documents in the file structure or tree or finding waddle. Search is a most common type of task, which is understandable because using visualizations, a lot of time people are used it to search for information. Um, many task types are based loosely on Amar's analytic task taxonomy. Um, some of the examples include search, find extremum, compute derived value, and sort. Um, if you're interested, it might be a good read to read Amar's paper about this. There are also six performance measures are the commonly used by researchers. Some of the most commonly used ones include speed, accuracy. Um, some others that are used include eye tracking, mouse data, or subjective measures. Um, the category of subjective measures here is very broadly defined, which includes user satisfaction, user satisfaction or user confidence in their answers they give. Um, Traditional measures such as speed and accuracy are most commonly used because they are very objective measures of user performance on tasks, which is understandably um, common and widely used by researchers. Usually high scores in study cognitive abilities, again, such as perceptual speed, verbal working memory, visual working memory, they are usually correlated with better task performance. More than half of the studies recruited local college students or faculty and staff members as user study participants. Some others used recruited participants from online platforms such as Amazon Mechanical Turk, and some others did not report where their participants come from. Um, there's one thing that I need to highlight here is that um, some people find that diff there are there there are differences between student participants and participants recruited from Amazon Mechanical Turk. Users recruited from M uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, MTurk is the acronym for this uh, platform, usually had a significantly wider range of ages, a more balanced gender ratio, and different personalities. For example, people recruited from Amazon Mechanical Turk, they have lower agreeableness, lower extraversion, and higher neuroticism. Um, so essentially the different, the two different populations of two different participant pools, they have different characteristics, which um, perhaps it will, it, will, it will be beneficial for future researchers to consider this if they want, if, uh, when they consider, conduct an experiment because um, the outcome of the, ex the experiment might depend on the participants they choose. Students, in general, they are really, they belong to a narrow subset of population. So um, the results find via students may or may not be representative of the general public. Some future directions we identify include automatically inferring trades from interactions, mouse data, using mouse data or eye tracking. Essentially, this is because um, conducting psychological tests to evaluate people's personality traits and cognitive abilities um, is very obtrusive, especially when one wants to individualize data visualizations for them. Um, it is time consuming and inconvenient to ask users to provide their uh, provide answers to psychological tests in order to um, assess their personality. 
uh, traits or cognitive abilities. So it's better to automatically infer these traits through the interactions. It is a passive way of um, passive and non-obtrusive way to assess people's traits. Um, also, another possible uh, direction of future research is really the open-ended task. Existing work typically they are goal-driven. They are hypothesis-driven, top-down tasks. They have a target goal. That's how the tasks are being designed. But sometimes um, we want to see how people uh, react to data or salient visual cues um, without a clearly defined task. So these are, we, 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 we say that we call them as bottom-up open-ended explorations. We want to see how, how people react and perform in this kind of environment compared to the current top-down top driven, uh, goal hypothesis driven task. Also, uh, another future direction includes investigating the relationship between individual traits and processing pro precedence across different designs. Okay, so in some cases, um, individuals with certain type of personality, they tend to focus on local features versus global features. But the vice, the, the reverse is true for some other individuals. And there is a lack of research in this, um, in this niche. The fourth, which is the most important part, is adaptation to individual needs. Um, this is the final goal of many of these uh, studies. They want to build systems that will automatically adapt dynamically adapt to individual needs and individual personality traits because they believe this better serves the purpose of visualization in conveying the data to a very diverse pool of users. Some examples include a behavior-driven visualization recommendation system that infers visual analytic tasks in real time and suggests visualization that might support a task better. Okay, there are many work that could possibly be done in this direction and um, is very important to the overall improvement of data visualizations. Thank you for your time. This is my presentation on a survey on individual differences in visualization. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was very, very interesting. Um, so we do have a uh, question from the uh, audience, uh, and that question is, is there a way to classify participants or to do it in parallel to your research without adding extra load on participants? Thanks. That's a really good question. And you're right. Most of the studies that we saw, they had people take psychological batteries in order to assess personality. And of course, that induces workload. So one of, the th one of the trends that we saw from more recent work is to try and automatically detect these traits by looking at mouse interactions or eye tracking data. Now this data is still very, um, very not very mature, so it means that we have a long way to go. But there is some uh, um, evidence that this is possible. For example, there is a work, um, the title of the paper I think is Finding Waldo, and that was conducted by some folks at Tufts University when I was there, and I was also a part of this work. And we showed that um, by analyzing a mouse interaction, you can use machine learning to detect personality traits. Now, of course, the detection rate for that was pretty low, but there is some promising results that you can indeed do that. And there are some other researchers that have done similar things with eye tracking as well. Thanks. Uh, so, Again, there's there's this question of added um, responsibility to a visualization researcher. Um, can you imagine there being instances in the future, if say we get this automatic um, personality detection stuff going, or or however we decide to integrate this work in, of having to design multiple visualizations, um, say for a similar task or the same task, but for different um, personality types. So I think that is possible, but that might be really dependent on uh, the domain. So like, for instance, I can't imagine that New York Times is gonna invest money to build multiple visualization for a specific audience. But if you think about 
for instance, someone who's an intelligence analyst, and there are two of them, then that would make a little bit more sense to, because number one, you would know their personality traits ahead of time. So it makes sense to design a visualization system specifically for that individual because they're making an error could be very costly. But in other instances, I think there might be some, at least if you, because this, okay, so this research is not new at all. Like if you look at documents from um, the 1980s where um, psychologists have been talking about this, one of the things that they've been advocating for is finding like universal visualizations. So uni visualizations that are not susceptible susceptible to individual differences and changes for individual differences. So that's one possible route. Um, the other possible route is the idea of adaptation. Um, again, this is another area of research that isn't new, but it is feasible to think about if you have a specific visual visualization design, how might you adapt it to, for a specific user? or to integrate things like learning from mouse interactions, learning from um, eye tracking data, and then make some changes to the visualization. In order to do that, however, it need, we need a lot of research into mapping personality traits onto um, visual encoding and specific attributes of the visualizations to figure out what exactly would you change, and then also look at what impact would, might that have on the individual that might be using it? Great. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. So I want to, again, thank all of my um, presenters and uh, everyone. Thanks so much. This is really great. Thank you.